Welcome back to the big board. Let's have a look at Jaws of Victory. And I thought this session, uh, this video, we might focus in on, I don't know, focus in on what's on the map, what the situation looks like to the player, and what we potentially could do, given that we haven't actually played a turn yet, and we, we have read the rules, we think we understand the rules, we think we understand how movement and combat and, and reserve movement and supply and all those wonderful little things all work together, and we think we've got the game set up correctly, let's have a, a peek at the system and see if we can't assess tactically what's the, what are some of the options for the Soviets, which are the dark sort of pseudo dark green khaki green sort of color I don't know what color you call that but this is the first Ukrainian front over here which extends all the way around to basically where that blue dye is and then uh, becomes the second Ukraine front and the uh, I forget the numbers specific numbers of the cores for the Germans but there are two core over here and two core over here uh, in terms of referencing uh, geographical reference, we've got Korsan here and Chikasi, or depending on how you say it, some other word. Uh, you've got that there. So <clears throat> in the Ukraine, if you were to head that way, you would eventually run into Kursk. And if you were to go this way, you would run into Rostov. So if you know those two locations, and then you could, that will give you a reference point and the Dempa or the Nempa River makes a big, uh, starts just to my left, well, it runs for miles and miles, but it runs in a big U shape and comes around and it actually is going to, it goes off map and it would come, come back in or around here somewhere like that, just near the Mictus Bourbon. Uh, so, so there you go. So let's have a look. <coughs> at this sort of situation and, and the setup and it's really as I look at this it's dire straits right dire straits for the Germans uh, fantastic opportunity for the Soviets to uh, kick some hiney and isolate a bunch of uh, enemy uh, units and potentially put them out of supply capture them kill them make them surrender whatever the case might be and so if we look at these forces I probably should know the well, we've got the uh, we've got the uh, the core numbers here. So, forty core or fortieth, uh, yeah, fortieth core, uh, no, fortieth army, I should say, here, and six tank army is here. I mean, is that right? I feel like I'm uh, I'm upscaling these just a tad, but I'm probably not. Let's just double check. Indeed, yes, fourth guards army. That's the wrong wrong force. Yeah, fortieth army and 6th Tank Army, 27th Army, and the 6th uh, Tank Army support units as well. There's a bunch of other support units. <clears throat> but basically, there are three army groups here, and I almost dropped the charts and knocked a whole bunch of units off the map. Uh, so if you look at, at this, this area here, where these gray blocks are, represent the sort of Hitler's orders to not you know, not one step back type of deal, where we've got to maintain a line, we've got to stay, there's a dotted gray line on the map, which is probably hard to see, but you, uh, you've got to keep units, uh, combat units within two hexes of this dotted line until such time as you're released. And there are four conditions that will allow you to be released. Let's not worry about what they are for the time being, but what's that, what that's doing is forcing you to keep a, a, a wealth of quite decent units out of any potential battle or building second def secondary defensive lines and things of that nature. So January 26th, 1944, this is kind of the starting situation. With a bit of a push in here, we can see quite a large force of, of units here. We've got uh, 27th, 27th Army divisions, uh, arrayed here they're all a class units and a class units full strength are going to have 20 combat factors and when they lose a step they'll have 16. important point here given it's the victory in the west system uh, 
there's a uh, most people think or believe and understand that that's a, a random chip pull for the strength of these these units with the A's and B's and C's and things on them. But in this particular game, it's allocating each class of unit a different strength capability and, and keeping that fixed within that class. So that, that uh, removes some of that randomness uh, given the, the late stage of the war. We know a little bit more about the strength and all the rest of it. Now, there have been some articles or commentary posted about uh, the formations here and what's available and what wasn't available based on the icons that are drawn on the on the tank units and on the artillery units. Yeah, that that's great. That's a level of detail that's not uh, going to be needed for me playing with uh, some battalion level formations. It's a armored unit. It's representing a combination of armored units. It's an AT unit. It's an AT, It's a artillery unit. It is what it is. We don't. I don't care if they were 122 millimeter, millimeter, 86 millimeter, or whatever they were. But I just don't care. Uh, what I care about is, did the guys do their research and did they get it roughly right, uh, within the bounds of reason? And are, are we using some representative icons here to show the capabilities? Now, if we're showing formations and units that were foot and that were really mechanized or motorized, and vice versa. That could be problematic. I could certainly see how that would be an issue because it would give uh, certain units an advantage. But in the main, I'm going to trust that the level of development and effort <clears throat> and primary research that's gone into this is good enough. And it's probably certainly better than anything that's been made prior to this because of the new information that's available, assuming that the folks took advantage of it. Anyway, let's get back to the tactics. So I was talking about uh, these, these A-class can, let me just zoom in. Maybe this will be better if I zoom in a little bit here. I've got to physically move the camera and bring it in a little bit without it walking over. I'm on my old camera stand because the new one slides on the Plex. Right, A class units. Then uh, you know this is a battalion level uh, formation here. Uh, here's an E class unit and an E class unit at full strength. If I can read it from here, is four. Um, you know, each one of these guys is supposed to have a, a counter underneath it, but <coughs> no need to put those on the map or clip them until they actually get into combat and take a loss or, or whatever the case may be. Facing off against C class units here all the way around until we get to this force here. And this force does not have to stay, sorry about the hands, does not have to stay locked in place but these guys do they're going to have to maintain a line until such time as they don't have to maintain a line all right uh so tough little situation here <coughs> a large force that will be made available turn four this is the fifth guard tank army that will be made available or sorry uh core that we made available here it's in reserve special rule for it on turn four uh, lots of uh, units i need to zoom out a little bit I'm, I'm to the side of the camera so i apologize for not being very uh, cognizant of my positioning here uh, another large formation here and here's an interesting thing all the way down here these units are not allowed to move I'm a little confused because uh, the scenario that we referenced to set up against and the campaign seem to have two different versions of what they should be doing. This says they can't attack or move below this level, but uh, the campaign rules say they come. They, they can't. They can move off and attack after the fifth turn. So I think these forces are basically static here, which is a bit of a pity because it might be a nice avenue of attack. That said. No Soviet unit is allowed to attack below this line or move below this line, nor attack or move below this line going across to the east. So that's a, a pretty significant, uh, whoops. My camera is sagging. I've had this problem before. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. So <clears throat> we can uh, probably expect to have some form of, uh, of concerted effort in this area 
uh, followed up by uh, a push here. It took the better part of two or three weeks, I think, for the Soviets to press. Where was it? Maybe it was only a week. Press them back to Medev, uh, Medvin, uh, Bogoslav, and uh, in just around this area here. So it took it took uh, it took quite a while. So the fighting was obviously fairly tenacious. Supply is obviously a big deal in this game, and we'll talk about that probably in another video when we actually get into rolling some dice and, and doing some things. But uh, so, you know, we've already spent 10 minutes on this. We haven't really got very far. This is one half of the map. So a complicated situation where, you know, these guys, these C-rated units are going to have uh, seven defensive factors. Now, there are DRMs and there are column shifts. Combined arms are going to give you column shifts. Uh, within your divisional uh, formations and you're going to receive column shifts for a, a fairly broad variety of other other um, types of things. I'm just looking here uh, whether the attack is supported or not. Obviously terrain matters, artillery matters, combat air support matters, hilltops matter, uh, a full Soviet division uh, attacking and assault engineers uh, being involved. All those types of things are going to, are going to give you uh, ratio shifts uh, moving from left to right, as the case may be. And then there are some of the others are combat strength modifiers. So these uh, these uh, improved positions are adding two combat factors. That's not uh, two shifts to the to the uh, combat results table. So here's the combat results table. I'll give you a little bit of a look at that. Uh, it's got a little track there. You can put a counter on it. Keep track your rods as you move things up and down the scale based on these items here. And you've also got <coughs> incidental combats that may occur between armored units. Uh, there are dots, uh, there are both black dots and white dots on these units, and they are going to give you a feel for uh, or give you an opportunity to conduct combat, particularly if they're all white dots. You'll have an uh, armor versus armored. Combat is a is a white dot unit here. You'll have armor versus armor in combat, and it's going to be a result that will push push a uh, a step loss on somebody. All right, let's see. Let's come over to this side now. Here's where the real pain, to, from my perspective, uh, appears. Look at that gap there. That's a three hexes wide, pretty significant hole. Uh, some decent units ready to press through with 16 combat factors, armor, AT guns, ooh, an F-rated unit that's full strength. That, I don't even have the F markers out. I don't know what they're, what they're worth. Something less than four, I can tell you that much. Uh, and then monster stacks of, uh, this is the, yeah, this is the 29th tank formation here. with all C-rated units, so they're gonna be strength of eight. They're armored. They have an infantry brigade attached to each of those formations. They are gonna move in the reserve move phase. So once all these guys have moved and attacked, they'll have an opportunity to exploit. And they're facing off against some pretty mediocre, there's some decent units in here, sevens. Oh, that's a 16. Why is that, uh, why is that factor underneath there? Oh, we need to check that, that looks like a problem there. Uh, <clears throat> C-rated unit there, which is going to be a, a seven factor defense factor. Here we've got a D-rated unit. I bet you this has got a this has got the he's got eight factors here. So this hole is both a substantial and b not well guarded. No IPs here. There's an IP here. Uh, that's a nice strong engineering unit. Really good armored for formations here with the three white dots give them some ability to afford uh, column shifts in defense and, and obviously in attack, but facing off a pretty significant force. Similarly, on the right hand flank, on the right flank here with the second Ukraine front, we've got a set of units here that can't be moved until the fifth turn. Um, much more heavily defended here though by the by the Germans, 
there's all these A-rated units, even though they are somewhat attrited. Um, just, I'm not gonna touch these guys, because I'm gonna end up knocking crap all over the place. So, you can see, this is gonna be painful. I don't know if uh, we can make it happen uh, to retreat fast enough from up in this area, where we don't have the front uh, obligations we, we need to maintain. I can push some units down here, maybe maybe make a counterattack and cut stuff off, or am I just gonna cut and run and try and uh, prevent the horns of both sides of this uh, Ukraine front one and two uh, pressing in on us. Ah, oh, my camera is slipping, so sorry. All right, uh, you know, maybe this river line makes a good defensive spot with Shopla here uh, being worthwhile to consider as a defensive location. It's also got a transit uh, train uh, terminal terminus here which allows us to uh, bring supply in and use it as a supply base so that's pretty nice as well but you know not a lot of good terrain to it uh, these, these can't be attacked across so that's interesting there'd be one two three hexes they couldn't attack across here so Novo Mira uh, Mergorod here would be another good location to try and uh, anchor our, uh, our base on once again, curiously not allowed as the Soviet play to attack south of here. So a pretty prickly, difficult situation for the Germans. Probably a, a smash and grab for the Soviets if I, if, you'll, if I look at it. Although I'm sure if we play very smart, we could do a lot of uh, extensive damage to the, to the uh, German forces if, you, if you're smart and wise with your... Uh, attack planning. You're not allowed to, you know, peek and look at the enemy's stack to see what they've got when you attack. So it's kind of uh, build the best attack you can and work it out from there. So that's, uh, that's kind of a tactical look at it. Well, it's not really a tactical look, I guess. It's kind of an overview of the situation. I'm, uh, I'm really unclear what I'm going to do with these guys. Uh, can't put any of these Germans into reserve to start the game that I'm aware of. It would be nice to have all this 14th Panzer formation here in reserve so that when these guys attacked in to this area here, we could lunge in there and maybe uh, knock the stuffing out of them a little bit, see what sort of damage we could do, because this is a particularly powerful little stack of guys. He said, <laughs> looking at that D-rated unit, not super powerful, but uh, there's, there's two tough regiments here. Uh, with some good armored support. Anyway, rambling on. There we go. I'm going to uh, see what's next and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Ciao.